Picture New York in the early 70s. It's the worst decade the city has experienced in a long time. Crime is at a new high. Murder and rape are off the charts. Empty, gutted buildings and warehouses that should rightly be torn down are home to squatters. The walls and subways are covered with graffiti. The streets are littered with needles and discarded who knows what. And the culture scene is absolutely thriving. Amidst all the wreckage, communities of artists are finding each other and creating some of the most innovative stuff that has ever come out of the city. Performance art, pop art, postmodernism, minimalism, you name it, it's happening. At Max's Kansas City, a nightclub, you can walk in and bump elbows with Jasper Johns or the Ramones. There's a gritty scene at CBGB. Patti Smith, Andy Warhol and his factory, John Cage. The quality of life may feel sketchy, but artistically, anything seems possible. Anyone could be an artist. It was an intoxicating thrill to create works and be able to sell them and The only regrets I have is that I didn't make and sell 10 times more than what I I did. (laughs) I'm Maria Kondakova, and this is The Grift. Stories about con artists and the lives they ruin. Today, one of the greatest art frauds of the 20th century and one whose aftermath is still being felt. The wild art scene of 1970s New York. That's where the story you're about to hear unfolds. But it begins in an art world of a different kind. The uptown scene the grand foyers and vaulted ceilings of Sotheby's auction house. Our protagonist, Ken Perenni, comes in. He introduces himself as an art dealer, and he's trying to sell an oil painting of a grand sailing ship on a stormy sea. The detail is exquisite. It looks like the sort of painting you chance upon in a quaint New England town and snatch up because of a certain je ne sais quoi that sets it apart from the other canvases. Ken says he found it at an antique shop. He doesn't know its value, or if it has any value at all, really. But he thought he would bring it by all the same, on the off chance it was worth something. Sotheby's is intrigued. They take the painting in for further inspection. And they authenticate it as a 19th century work by James Buttersworth, a prolific artist known for his maritime paintings. Ken makes $20,000 on the sale. He's ecstatic. That's a lot of money for a young man who's never even been to college. And he's excited to put it to good use. He uses a chunk to buy quality canvases and oil paints for himself. You see, Ken is not just an art dealer. He's a skilled painter in his own right. He may not have had his own gallery show yet, But he's immersed in the burgeoning art scene and often invites friends to see his work in his studio. Sometimes he even gives away paintings to his closest friends. He's trying to build up his name, and in the 1970s climate of possibility, it's not so crazy to think that his might be the next star to rise. And it's not so crazy that an aspiring painter would work part-time as a dealer. Art dealing, after all, has long been a time-respected way to make a living while honing your own art. But what is crazy is that in Ken's case, the two things aren't as far apart as they might seem. In fact, they are one and the same. You see, the paintings Ken Perenni is selling are the same paintings he is making. Ken Perenni is an artist of a different ilk. He is a master forger. I'm a great lover of art and fine paintings, first and foremost. 
And I spent my entire life from the time I was well, basically 18 years old, painting pictures and figuring out how to turn them into money. <laughs> the only thing Ken Perini loved as much as art was swindling the art world. He relished the contest of wits, the risk of getting caught, the thrill of deception, the sense of power that comes with a successful con. But more than anything else, he loved to see his work get the recognition he always felt it deserved. Ken's original work never got much attention. Everything seemed possible downtown, but somehow he failed to make the grade. But his fakes? His fakes were something else. Those were brilliant. He successfully forged and sold art to the great galleries and auction houses around the world for over 30 years. Ken Perenni might be a mediocre artist, but he is a great con artist. His story begins in New Jersey in 1967. Ken is your typical disengaged teenager without much interest in anything, until one day when he meets a group of artists living nearby in a decrepit mansion. Which was known locally in Fort Lee as the castle. It was sort of a local curiosity, this house. And it was very dramatically situated on the cliffs with a beautiful view of the Hudson River and Manhattan. The artists were bohemian types who'd moved in to get away from the city and Ken instantly became enamored with their world. I was more or less just a, a groupie, a hanger on there, but I wanted to be like one of them. And I started going to galleries, art shows, museums with them, tagging along. And I was exposed for the first time to art. It was a revelation. Ken was just a working class kid from New Jersey. He went to a vocational high school, he fixed cars. But wandering around the Met, he fell in love with the European masters. The lush floral bouquets of Jan Bruegel, Hubert Robert's Roman ruins, dreary canal scenes by Francesco Guardi. And before long, Ken decided he wanted to make art. So I guess in the brashness of youth, I got some brushes and some canvas. Courtesy of his friends at the castle, and he began teaching himself to paint in oils. As an exercise, he tried copying old masters. I remember the first picture I painted was a small copy of a Rembrandt, a small portrait of Christ that he did. And I surprised myself, and I tried another and another after that. I tried Dutch paintings and Flemish paintings, and I started developing a real talent. Ken had an eye for detail, a steady hand. He was a natural. And one of the artists at the castle took notice. He was so impressed with my ability to paint in the style of the old masters, which he suggested as a lark. Well, look, I just read this book on Hans Van Meegren. Van Meegren was a famous forger, active from the 1920s through the start of World War II. He specialized in faking Vermeers. Why don't you read it, and why don't you try and make a fake, and you can sell some paintings and... <laughs> keep going. And um, so I took him up on it. By now, Ken was 18 and had finished high school. He wanted to move into the city and become an artist, but he needed cash to do it. So the idea of selling a fake painting, well, he might as well try. It turns out the Van Meegren book wasn't just the biography of a forger. It was a how-to guide. Step one. Find a genuine antique painting, but a cheap one. This would be the base, what people in the forgery business call the support. It can be an actual painting or a piece of wood from the appropriate time period. Ken noticed that a lot of the Flemish paintings he loved were painted on wood panels. So he went looking for antique furniture and found that the inside of a drawer in an 18th century desk would work perfectly. Luckily, Antique drawers were plentiful. Step two, the painting. Van Meegren was successful because he produced paintings in the style of Vermeer, but didn't make exact copies. If he had, he would have been caught right away, or at least far sooner than he was. 
But when authenticators saw his work, they saw a painting done in Vermeer's style on a canvas that was dated to the right period. Logically, it seemed like it was a previously undiscovered Vermeer. And that made it even more valuable. It was a lost period of Vermeer's art that shed an entirely new light on his career. It was a brilliant move. And had it not been for World War II, you might be admiring some of the forgeries as real Vermeers today. The only reason Van Meegeren was ever caught was for selling art to the Nazis. After the war, he had to prove that he had sold forgeries to escape a far harsher sentence of collaboration with the enemy. Inspired by Van Meegeren's success and undaunted by his downfall, Ken Perenni went to the Met in 1967 and chose six Flemish portraits to draw inspiration from. He made a composite sketch, taking the nose from one, the hairstyle and tunic from another, the positioning of the hands from a third, and so on. Like Van Meegeren, he would create Flemish portraits that almost but not quite match the existing works. The third step was aging and cracking the painting. Normally, an oil painting takes at least a few months to dry. To speed up the process, Ken baked his paintings in the sun for a few weeks. But he wasn't finished yet. You've seen the fine hairline cracks in old paintings, but how to replicate that? This is where the real work began. Ken first studied the cracking patterns in old paintings. Then, he used an engraver's needle and a magnifying glass to painstakingly etch the fine lines into the painting he was working on. It was the most labor-intensive part of the whole process and took days to complete. But you couldn't rush it. Accurate cracks were the ticket to authenticity. I'm still perfecting and developing and refining new ways of creating crack patterns, patinas. He next applied a powdered pigment wash to darken the cracks and make them look bolder and more authentic. And finally, he applied a brown varnish over the top to imitate an antique patina. But would his painstaking work fool experienced art dealers? For Ken's first experiment, he chose one of his creations, what he thought was a remarkably authentic-looking painting of a middle-aged man with a long nose, thin lips, and a monk's cropped haircut, wearing an austere black tunic. Ken popped his composite forgery into a used manila envelope and brought it to the now-defunct Efron Gallery on 57th Street in New York. I walked in with a painting under my arm and just, it was very simple. Found this at an antique show, looked familiar, something I may have seen in a magazine or something. Then Ken let the gallerist tell him where the painting came from and when it was done. And the gallery authenticated it as an 18th century Flemish work. And I managed to sell it. I have to confess, I became fascinated with the act of creating a modern painting, making it look old, and can I sell this as a period work? It's an intellectual and artistic challenge. Soon, he was developing his own methods of aging paintings and his own personal touches for making a work seem even more authentic. Here's one thing he'd do. He noticed that old paintings that had been previously sold at auction had stickers on the backs. And the stickers, of course, had aged too. So he bought some new stickers and dyed them with tea to make them look old, then stuck them to the backs of his paintings. He also noticed that auction houses used chalk to write serial numbers on the backs of the paintings they sold. So Ken wrote some numbers in chalk on the backs of his paintings. Then he'd partially rub it off to make it look like the painting had been handled. All of these little tricks not only gave his paintings the illusion of age, they suggested that these pieces had been authenticated and sold before, and that made the auction houses more likely to buy them. Anyway, moving uptown was a game changer for Ken's forgery career, because instead of living among the avant-garde artists, he was among wealthy collectors. 
and it wasn't long before he befriended some of them. Jimmy Rico was an eccentric. He lived as a semi-recluse, and he lived in a magnificent old mansion just 20 minutes north of New York City. He was very well known in the art world, and he was sitting on one of the greatest collections of American paintings and sculpture in the country. Jimmy sensed that the market for 19th century American landscapes was about to blow up. He also knew that Ken was in the business of art forging. And Jimmy had a plan for me. He felt that I could apply my abilities to faking 19th century American paintings, which was his passion, his love. Sotheby's had just established their American painting department in their New York auction house. Jimmy Rico wanted to get me in on the ground floor. He was set on the idea of seeing if I could create paintings where his beloved artists left off and continue their work. He didn't care about what anybody thought about him. He didn't care for art dealers much. And he just wanted to do this. It was, I think, irresistible for him to be part of this uh, creative process. I started producing my first 19th century American fakes. And two of my Buttersworths, uh, James E. Buttersworth, uh, an important marine painter that I learned to uh, emulate early on under Jimmy's direction. Two of those were in one of the first or second sales that Sotheby's had of American paintings. Buttersworth was known for painting grand ships in very fine detail. Ships on calm seas, ships on stormy seas. Sometimes he'd branch out a bit and even paint a steamboat. A Buttersworth is essentially fancy wallpaper. And yet the choice to paint fake Buttersworths was ingenious because Buttersworth is a second or third tier painter. He's known, but he's not Rembrandt or Vermeer. That means that a Buttersworth has a lower value which means that the auction house will not devote as much energy into authenticating it, so it comes under less scrutiny. What's more, as Jimmy Rico explained to Ken, no one thinks something like a Buttersworth is worth forging. Why would anyone waste time on something like that? There's one more reason why Ken's chosen route was so brilliant. Unlike a painting by a more famous artist, something like a Buttersworth doesn't need a solid provenance, or a record of ownership of a painting that traces all the way back to the painter himself. If you're forging a major work of art, you better have good provenance as proof of authenticity. A major painter leaves tracks, so you'd need to forge that as well. And a convincing backstory with accurate documentation can be much more difficult to come by. But by painting Buttersworths, Ken could skip that part. He could say that he bought the painting at an antique sale or a garage sale. And that was perfectly believable because people would sell these things without knowing what they had. And art dealers often took advantage of that, buying the painting for cheap and then selling it at a much higher price at auction. So Ken and Jimmy's scheme worked really well. And this was the great turning point in my life because then it went from something I did just to keep me alive to a real career, because now I was making serious money for the first time. But for Ken, it wasn't just about the money anymore. He became addicted to the thrill of the con. I found it as a contest of wits, an intoxicant, and an addiction to the risk-taking and the thrill of the payoff and seeing a painting that I knew I painted myself go up on the stage at Sotheby's and be handled with porters that had white gloves on to handle it very carefully and sit in the audience and know that I painted it a few months ago. Ken abandoned his career as an original artist in favor of his forgery career. But he wouldn't put it that way himself. I actually became an original artist in an unusual way because the challenge for me was to create new and original paintings, but within the creative 
perimeters of the artists that I was emulating. Somebody else's creative parameters. But no matter. As long as Ken painted under someone else's name, he didn't have to be vulnerable as an artist. He didn't run the risk of having his own original work rejected by the art world. The only people he had to impress, or rather fool, were the authenticators at the auction houses. So Ken's real art became the process of making a modern fake look like a real antique. I pride myself on being able to equal, and if I may say so, by many estimates, even surpass the quality of many of the masters that I emulate. Coming up after the break, how Ken Perenni became a victim of his own fraudulent success. Now back to the world of art fraud. When we left Ken Perenni, he'd figured out how to make really good copies of -of middle-of-the-road paintings. He didn't just make good fakes. He made lots of them. And he expanded his repertoire. He made so many paintings, he couldn't sell them all on his own. I teamed up with my old friend from the castle, Tony Masaccio. Even though he'd lived at the castle, Tony wasn't your run-of-the-mill arty type. Originally, he came from a well-known mafia family in Brooklyn. He had nerves of steel. He could walk in anywhere and make a very successful sale. Uh, And uh, (laughs) we were selling the paintings all over New York City. Tony was taking paintings that I produced and going out on the west coast of the United States and selling them to galleries in California and Beverly Hills, and then he'd fly down to Texas and sell some. And then the paintings started showing up in the sales catalogs. Ken said he'd see paintings he'd sold in D.C. or L.A. showing up in the auction catalogs from Sotheby's or Christie's in New York. Ken and Tony made more money than they knew what to do with. And as two guys in their 20s, they were going to take full advantage of it. Traveled, lots of money to spend, shopping, beautiful girlfriends, going to clubs. It went on like that for years, and it was all so easy. There was no scrutiny at all. Or so it seemed. We were inexperienced. We weren't sophisticated enough to understand how small the art world really is. We didn't realize that wherever you sold them, no matter how far away you were, they would all funnel their way back into New York City. And in time, it started raising eyebrows. Too many of the same type of paintings started showing up in too short of a time. In 1980, Tony got picked up by the FBI. Tony was lucky. He was only caught selling one painting. And he was interviewed three times in connection to this painting that he had been caught selling. Growing up with the mob, Tony was no stranger to interrogations. He stood up for his friend, and he didn't talk. He made up a story, he bought it somewhere, and that was it. He stood up, but our business was shut down. At this point, most people would get out of the game. I had made a lot of money, had a lot of investments, did very well, and I figured I'd go and live in Britain and just forget about things. Except, what would he do then? For Ken, it wasn't just about his love of art and painting, or even the intellectual challenge of making a good fake. He liked how it felt to put one over on the authenticators, the auction houses, the buyers, the art world elite themselves. He liked feeling in control. Who's the great artist now? And so I went back in business on the other side of the Atlantic. He moved to London in the early 80s and immediately began attending art auctions. Sitting in the sales rooms and just observing the action, almost like, uh, you know, when you're learning how to buy and sell stocks, you just, like a tape reader, you just watch the action. He noticed that wealthy Londoners loved 19th century equestrian paintings. The decorators wanted this type of thing for English interiors. You've seen these paintings. 
guys on horses in the countryside. Sometimes it's just the horse, sometimes just the guy with a hound. But they're always very fine, very detailed, and very much an upper-class British stereotype. And just like those Buttersworths, glorified wallpaper. As soon as I saw these paintings being sold in the sales rooms, I thought, you know, I could paint these horses and the jockeys and so on. He started forging J.F. Herring, James Seymour, John N. Sartorius. I would paint them, age them, crack them, and so on. And then I would just walk into the sales room, and it would only be literally a matter of minutes before I could be walking out with a contract in my hand. As fast as I painted the pictures, they would sell them. Business was better than ever. And this time, Ken didn't want to make the same mistakes he made in the U.S. But he also didn't want to slow down his sales. So he devised some tactics to avoid getting caught. First, he diversified. I... uh judiciously uh, rotated paintings around. In other words, I would put a marine painting in Sotheby's, and then I had Phillips houses in London that I would put an equestrian painting in. So I, I never put too many of the same kind of paintings in any one house. His second tactic, staying on the move. I would go to Oxford, I would go to Bath, I would go to London, I would go up to Ipswich. I would go all over distributing paintings. And third, Ken got himself a reputation. Once in a while, he sold paintings under a pseudonym, but by now he'd learned just how small the art world was. So if he went by more than one name, he'd be more likely to get caught. But if a lot of people in the art world knew him as a reputable dealer, they'd be that much more likely to take him at his word. And his fakes would come under even less scrutiny. I've often been asked, well, wouldn't they get suspicious with you constantly turning up so many paintings? But really, it wasn't, if you really understand the business. There are people that do nothing but hunt for paintings and are well-known at the auction houses, always bringing in paintings. In two decades, he had made a killing. He bought a big, beautiful house in Florida and moved there. He kept painting horses, kept selling his work to auction houses in England, only now he just shipped the paintings across the ocean. And he decided that the coast was clear to re-engage in his home market, back to his roots, back to good old Americana. He figured that his forgery scandal of 1980 had blown over, and what can he say? He missed the American styles. He had one more great success. Some might say his greatest. A previously undiscovered masterpiece by Martin Johnson Heed, part of his Gems of Brazil series. He'd read that many of the hummingbird paintings in the series had been finds in England, so he painted one of his own and claimed he'd bought it at a flea market in Bristol for three pounds. Ken says it sold at Christie's for 96000 But Perenni's streak couldn't possibly last. And unfortunately, well, I guess uh, I was my own undoing, my own worst enemy. I had friends that I uh, gave paintings to as gifts. Exact replicas of paintings that he'd been selling to the auction houses. So all of these copies were out in the world. Ken knew it was careless. Even worse, it was hubristic. And to my chagrin, a girlfriend of mine made a disastrous sale. She, unbeknownst to me, she took one of my fakes and went to London and sold it, or put it in, in Bonham's auction house. And she figured, well, look, Ken's making all this money that I see, you know, I see him doing it all the time, making money. I could use twenty or 30000 myself. It was a duplicate of a painting I had put in Sotheby's a year or two before. And so when this painting that she sold at Bonhams was published and used as a promotion for the sale, because it was a very fine little painting, well, this immediately raised eyebrows. It was impossible for this to happen. Uh, the two paintings are showing up in too short of a time. They were identical almost. 
she got caught. And unlike Ken's friend Tony Masaccio, who'd grown up with the mafia, she didn't know how to cover her tracks. She led the FBI to my door because she was compromised. And it was my fault for letting paintings slip out of the envelope, you might say. Was that the end of your relationship? Oh, yes. (laughs) That'll do it every time. (laughs) The FBI investigation began in 1998 with a knock on Ken's door. They were investigating his connection to two paintings by Buttersworth that had been sold at Christie's and Sotheby's. I was called in for endless questionings. When the FBI looked into my affairs, my lawyers and I agreed. There was no sense trying to deny that I uh, painted what we called reproductions at that time. We figured we'd term them reproductions of period art. There was no sense denying that. My claim was that I just didn't sell them illegally. And so that was my defense, as flimsy as it was. But the FBI wouldn't let up for years. And it was beginning to drive Ken a little crazy. It was just more questions more pictures of paintings for me to look at, more evidence that they discovered about me, and I wanted it to end. I was hoping at some point, would you finally indict me or do what you're going to do, and let's get this over with. And while the investigation was going on, were you still producing forgeries? Actually, I was. Except now, he was also doing it as a cover. He built a legitimate business painting and selling his so-called genuine reproductions. It's only fraud if you misrepresent the painting as the real thing. Otherwise, copy all you want. Meanwhile, the FBI was still trying to build a case against him. His associates were being interviewed. He was being pulled in for questioning. And then, one day... Ken was notified that his case was being closed. It was 2003, five years since the FBI first started investigating him. The statute of limitations had run up, and they hadn't found enough evidence to indict him. And that was the end of it. You were never indicted. You never spent mm-hmm. any time in jail. And right. um, is, it, is it correct to say that you basically paid no penalty whatsoever for all of the forgeries mm-hmm. that you created over three decades? Yeah, I guess it is. Uh, it, that would be uh, correct. Did you ever feel bad for the end buyer who, you know, unwittingly got this from an auction house thinking that it had been kind of vetted um, and was really buying one of your paintings? And um, did you ever think of them? Did you ever care about them? No, not in the least, because I always felt that they were getting the perhaps the better part of the bargain. They got a beautiful work of art. Uh, After all, aren't you supposed to be buying art for the aesthetic enjoyment as an art collector? So no, no, no regrets at all. I think they've done very well for their investment. So just to clarify, a number of your forgeries are out in the world as authentic works today. Uh, How many? Well, uh, do do you, you, yeah, do you know how many or or, uh, thereabouts? (laughs) Well, I could safely say with certainty at least a couple thousand are out there somewhere after all these years because I, uh, uh, one of these days I will publish a catalog and I have at least uh, well a couple thousand photographs dating back into the 70s of works that I produced. I think it was uh, a great, uh, <laughs> from my standpoint, an achievement. And I make no apologies for it, but at least give me credit for one thing. I'm honest. I'm not sorry for it. In his lack of remorse, Ken Perenni is the quintessential grifter. It's never about the victims. Or rather, it's all about taking advantage of the victims. They aren't seen as victims. Rather, they deserve it. As he puts it, aren't they getting the better end of the deal? Aesthetic pleasure? He doesn't seem to care that he's deceived them. Instead, he takes pleasure in the deception. It's part of his art. He thrives on the power of manipulation. It's energizing for him. 
It's addictive. It's why he couldn't stop even after he should have. And it's why he takes such pride in revealing his exploits to us. He wants to be appreciated as the artist he is. But really, I'd still be hard-pressed to call him artist without the con. Doesn't an artist need originality, a voice, an idea of his own? Perenni insists he could have succeeded. I think he did succeed, and brilliantly, but at deception, not at art. Perenni doesn't agree. After the FBI investigation, Ken says he never went back to passing off his fakes as the genuine article. But he says his original ambitions have returned in full. I think I'm kind of like, uh, you know, you read about like addicted gamblers that finally get kick it and they talk about it years later. And it's, it, it was a great chapter in my life. But at this stage in my life, I'm older. And my satisfaction now is just creating really great works of art. Do you paint any Ken Perennis? Yes, I do. Actually, I still have a fascination and a desire to paint contemporary abstract impressionist paintings. One day, maybe I'll still have a show in New York City. <laughs> there is a style of art called abstract impressionism, but it's fairly obscure, especially compared with abstract expressionism. The artists that Perenni talked about in our conversations are all in the expressionism business, not an abstract impressionist among them. So it seems Perenni isn't completely clear on the original art he wants to create, or the career he claims he wants to get back to. And unlike the 1970s, he can't plead poverty as an excuse for not doing original work. Certainly he would never plead lack of original talent, but who's asking? Today, he's still living in Florida, and he's still painting and selling replicas for, as he calls it, decorative purposes only. And as before, he has willing buyers. I had to come out of the shadows and advertise them and sell them as the finest fakes in the world, and that's what I still do today. I think they're better than ever before, but I don't have the thrill anymore. I don't have the intoxicating thrill of selling them as originals. The Grift is produced by Adelia Rubin, Shoshi Shmulevitz, and Jacob Smith. Our editor is Julia Barton, and our fact checker is Jen Schwartz. Ben Levin composed our music. Special thanks to the Panoply management team, Mia Lobel, Laura Mayer, and Andy Bowers. The Pinna app has hours and hours of great ad-free audio for kids. Try the Pinna app for free. For more information, go to pinna.fm slash listen.